sentiment and sentimentality. The poem's symbiotic relationship with sentiment slash sentimentality. Part 1. Mutualism. When poetry and sentiment mutually benefit. Like cows, and intestinal bacteria. In this relationship, the poem is benefited by sentiment, and, the sentiment in the poem benefits by the success of the poem. The language within the poem is successful. Language is the vehicle for sentiment. Sentiment is enhanced by language. Language and sentiment mutually benefit. For example, Rachel Zucker. Zucker employs a combination of expected appliances but she habits them with a precision that makes the confessionalistic nature of her poems pop with excitement. And she does it. It. She folds back the peel of some poetic fruit, and has us take a bite, and we are surprised that it doesn't taste like everything else, even though we know the components of the fruit, and how it got here. We know that the fruit contains broken lines and expectations. For example, consider the following line. Books with prominent serifs. Their feet, feet, feet I am marching to the same bee. End quote. But we savor a line like that anyhow, even though we know that the rhyme is coming and the erasure of the end of the word still sparks a significance in our reading, but that particular cut has made the line palatable. Or she cooks us up a dish that reminds us that we are still reading and not consuming. Reminds us of Ron Suleiman saying something like, Encounter the text, let it rub up against you and trip over it, don't escape into a world beyond the language, so Zucker gives us big chunks of stew meat to chew and swallow. But we can't swallow because, god damn it, tastes so good to chew on a line like. Come, thrust your strong beak. Into the solid floor of sky. Hang on there and on until it stops. This love. Obedience. End quote. Because we, as poets, know how hard and how many damn metaphors you have to go through to get the perfection of solid floor of sky. So Zucker's language is successful and the sentiment within adds to the broken expectations. She still uses words that hark in the relationship between sentiment and the romantic like, love, and sky and the occasional baby. She even steps on the world of the precious by discussing family and relationships, husbands and wives. But this romance, what could verge on nasty sentimentality, does not because language and mechanics divert the reader's attention away from their expectations. Part 2 commensalism. One benefits the other stays the same. Like barnacles attached to the shell of a scallop. Yum. The success of the poem is not reliant on the success of the sentiment. Sentiment may be a part of the larger construct of the poem, but if sentiment fails, then the poem still has the foundation of other mechanisms to maintain structure. For example, in Sarah Vap's poem, Lifted, Adorning, then there are several moments where sentiment could be signified through image, say perhaps, painting the baby chick's pastel colors, or the ducks in the water. These images are so close to adoration of nature or the diminutive, that their sheer presence in a poem could distract from the work of the poem and moves the reader into a world of landscape and beauty. The mere existence of the diminutive, the small, the precious, is not to be ignored, but insertion of these images into the world of the poem projects a sense of anti-realism. Perhaps a motion towards the Byzantine. Which is to say the inception of the diminutive and sweet rejects the world of realistic mimicry in favor of symbolic meaning. So when Sarah Vap inserts pint-sized images she is standing on the edge of a sentimental precipice, Possibly on the verge of ruining a perfectly good poem because there were one too many pink baby chicks. But the poem is not ruined by the chicks or the beautiful face of the father. If the poem is a sea scallop, and sentiment are barnacles, we can see how sentiment benefits from its place attached to the poem. The poem is a construct, oftentimes discussed as being an artifice in which beauty can be found, 
Of course this is a conservative definition of the poem, but it is relevant. Sentimental images can benefit by being part of the beautiful artifice. Discussing a duck on a pond to your girlfriends on a Friday night is not the same as constructing an image of a duck on a pond in some sort of technical frame. There is a reason poetry for so long was devoted to the reconstruction of beauty into the frame of language and sound. Because the image benefited from the framework of the medium. Vaps baby chicks benefit from being attached to a poem, for many reasons, one of which is the move into aesthetic, into foreverness. The real chicks are dead now, but they live on, through the poem. In this case, with this poem, the overworked images of the diminutive aesthetic does not harm the sea scala poem. The poem is still successful, the lines are still strong and sonic. The images are interesting and reliable, and the poem, as well as the book, is successful. Part 3 Parasitism One benefits and one loses. Parasites, like humans eating the earth until she is bone dry, and very, very, Sad. Sentiment sucks the life out of the poem. There are cases where the sentimental context of the poem, or work of poetry has an adverse effect on the poem. This seems to be true for the world of experimental poetry, specifically experimental poetry that relies on contextual information to enhance the sentimental experience for the poem. For this example, we will look at Ronald Johnson's Radio S which is a book constructed by erasure of John Milton's Paradise Lost. I would not go as far as to say that Radio S is a book whose intention is to induce sentiment, but I will say that the context of the poem, and the poems within the book brush up to sentimentality via topics and contextualism. Because the book is constructed by erasure from Paradise Lost, we must consider the sentiment attached to or available in Milton's work. For the work of Milton, sentimentality is directly related to the sublime. And the sublime was only reached by humans, through God. So one of the goals of the sentiment in Paradise Lost is to elevate the reader into the world of godliness. We are ignoring the satirical motives of Milton in this case. Ronald Johnson's book reconstructs Milton's poem and removes the words, God and Satan thus leaving himself a palette of words around the ideas of God and Satan. This palette is full of the sublime and the grotesque. Johnson works with the words, images, and sublime in a very mechanical way. Oftentimes the words mimic the motions that they make, for example a line that says, for proof, look up, is positioned at a certain place on the page that suggests to the reader a looking up as in directly above the line, to the erased line, hinting that if the text were in full, the word, God, could be found directly above the motion. And the line is also positioned so that the reader could physically look up, beyond the world of the page and search for the face of God in their own world. I find this stroke of erasure, and many other very similar gestures, to be extremely sentimental. But the sentimentality is not attached to the images like in Vap, or to the atmosphere of the poem, like in Zucker. No, the sentimentality is attached to the context around the work. In order to obtain the sublimity of Johnson, you must filter it through the sublimity of Milton. In order to recognize God on the page, you have to have known that God was, quite literally, erased from the page. So this omnipresence of sentimentality, this gloriousness of an all-surrounding God, is only sentimental because of the concept. So how is this parasitism? The sentimentality in this particular work is fairly clear. There are constant motions at the missing God, the God that has been erased, and the God that cannot be found. This also pushes the notions of sublimity through the self. Sublimity through the construction and reconstruction of the individual until the individual can fulfill their personal God. These concepts are lovely, enlightening, sentimental, transcendental, and well represented. But the sentimentality of the concept, the world around the poetry is far more interesting, far more moving, 
far more satisfying than the poems themselves, which are empty, uncrude, at times the concept shines through specific lines, then those lines are forgotten for the sake of the next concept. As the reader moves through the book, sentimentality is performative, is available, but only as a fulfillment of the concept. The poem suffers for the sake of the concept, which is sublimity, which is a sentimental concept. The words on the page, the language, the mechanics suffer for the larger picture. This was the poem's symbiotic relationship to sentiment and sentimentality. Thank you. Goodbye.